Thank you. Um, I am Naila Nasir. Um, I'm the brand new president of the Spencer Foundation. <laughs> oh. I am incredibly excited to welcome you to the 2018 AERA Spencer Lecture. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on indigenous lands, specifically of the Lenape people, and recognize that New York City has the largest population of indigenous people in the United States. I'm hoping my voice holds out. I've been clearly talking too much. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the staff, the staff at Spencer who organized these events and all the events we've been holding in the Spencer suite over the course of these meetings, Doris Fisher in particular. Um, round of applause. I also want to acknowledge the, the AV staff, the wait staff, and all of the hotel staff that has made it possible for us to have this meeting and to be here in this beautifully well-designed room and um, to enjoy the food that we will enjoy at the reception after. Thank you to the wait staff and hotel staff. And final bit of housekeeping, I want to mention our survey. Um, as many of you know, we've been thinking um, long and hard about the funding priorities at Spencer, and we want your input. So on your chair, you will notice two things. A card that gives the link to our survey, which you can also access from our website. Um, but we, we, we want to make sure that what we do in the next iteration at Spencer reflects your priorities, re reflects the priorities of the field. So we would love your input. And the second thing on the chair is the yellow ticket that is your admission to the reception afterwards. So be sure to take it with you when, you when you go. All right. So I'm super excited about the conversation we're going to have here tonight. Um, sometime last year, as I was preparing to go to an academic meeting, I was chatting with my then 17-year-old daughter, telling her about all of my friends and colleagues that were going to be there. And without missing a beat, my daughter, who may be in this room, oh, she's in the back of the room there. Um, my daughter <laughs> looked at me with a curious expression on her face. And she said, so mommy, you and your friends are all getting older. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's OK. Time will take care of that one. Um, the next part is worse. She says, and you all keep writing. But high school is getting worse. <laughs> and she just looked at me like, and so you need to explain to me this conundrum of how you're doing this work and you've been doing it all of these years with all of these people that are passionate and care about education and care about equity and nothing's changing. And it was kind of one of those moments, you know those moments when your kids are kind of politely calling you out and what was in her eyes was why, why isn't this mattering? Like I don't understand the, the tension between these two things. And so her question in some ways gets at the heart of the impetus for the discussion that we're having here tonight. In my new role, I've been thinking a lot about the role of research, right? which to my mind is to help us understand processes of teaching and learning more deeply, to make sense of the powerful role that structures have on the lives of individuals, and ultimately to impact educational policy and practice. These goals fit with what scholars in the field have been telling us. Right? We've been doing this um, listening tour, which many of you have been a part of. We visited over 40 schools of ed at institutions across the country, myself and the program staff. And what we're hearing, among other things, is that people want their work to matter. At its best, research is a generative activity. And I don't just mean that it generates more and more journal articles and books, which, you know, of course, we hope it does. Um, but I mean generative in the sense that it helps us to generate, to create something new, to envision a future that has not yet come to be. And so that's what we're up to with this panel tonight, to reflect on what we know as a field around powerful public schooling, and to do so in a way that opens up the possibility for generativity. The panelists here tonight were all attendees at, the meeting, uh, at a meeting Mark Lamont Hill and I held at Temple University with 25 amazing scholars this past December. The point of the meeting was to reflect together on the role and value of public education and the fundamental shifts that have occurred in our national discourse around schooling, specifically the use of market-based frames and a disinvestment in the notion of public schooling as a public good that is in service of an educa educated, critical, informed citizenry. Instead, public schools are being framed as a private good 
that families and schools can leverage for personal gain. So in alignment with Deborah's theme for this year's AERA meeting, we thought it was an important time to reconsider the role and possibility of public schooling and to reinvest in an ambitious future for public schools. So towards that end, this panel will take up questions around the kinds of schools that we as educational researchers can imagine when we envision an ambitious public educational future. Each panelist will focus on a different aspect of schooling, including the organization of schools and districts, pedagogy, teacher training, and the working lives of teachers, and the possibilities for a new, a new consideration of the roles that families and communities can have. And so, with no further ado, let me introduce the panelists on stage here behind me and my co-moderator. My co-moderator tonight is Deborah Lowenberg-Ball. She is the William H. Payne Collegiate Professor of Education at the University of Michigan and the Director of Teaching Works. She taught elementary school for more than 15 years and continues to teach mathematics to elementary students every summer. She studies the practice of teaching as the active work of building relationships with children to support their learning and flourishing. She was also the Dean of the, of the School of Education at University of Michigan from 2005 to 2016 and is this year's president of AERA. Um, Zeus Leonardo, and we're just going to go kind of towards me that way. Zeus Leonardo is a professor of education at the University of California, Berkeley. His current research interests involve the study of ideologies and discourses in education with respect to change. He draws on insights from sociology, contemporary philosophy, and cultural studies, and engages critical theories to inform his analysis of the relationship between schooling and social relations such as race, class, culture, and gender. His research is informed by the premise that educational knowledge should promote the democratization of schools and society. He is a fellow of the American Educational Research Association. Megan Bang is a professor of education and American Indian Studies at the University of Washington, Seattle. Her work focuses on the study of learning and development in and across everyday contexts using interdisciplinary approaches, including experimental cognitive studies, field studies, and community-based design with a focus on science learning. She serves on the Board of Science Education for the National Academies. Pam Grossman is the Dean and George and Diane Weiss Professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. She studies teacher, professional, teacher and professional education, teacher knowledge, and the teaching of English in secondary schools. She served as co-principal investigator of a five-year study of pathways into teaching in New York City schools, fo focusing on the features of preparation that affect student achievement. She also serves on the boards of some of the nation's foremost organizations for promoting rigorous educational research and teacher excellence, and is my board chair. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Jal Mehta is an associate professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. His research explores the role of different forms of, of knowledge in tackling major social and political problems, particularly problems of human improvement. He has written extensively on what it would take to improve American education, with a particular focus on the professionalization of teaching, and is currently working on a contemporary study of schools, systems, and nations that are seeking to produce ambitious instruction. He is the co-editor of the Learning Deeply blog at Education Week. And finally, Eve Ewing is a sociologist of education whose research is focused on racism, social inequality, and urban policy, and the impact of these forces on American public schools and the lives of young people. She is an assistant professor in the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago. She is also an essay, essayist and poet whose work has been featured in The New Yorker and The Atlantic Monthly. Uh, Mark Lamont Hill, who is listed on the program as a respondent, is unable to join us tonight. He is currently stuck on an airplane. <laughs> Those of you that know Mark know that is not an unusual <laughs> location for him. <laughs> but he sends his regrets that he couldn't be here. Uh, so the flow of tonight's event, um, I will invite Deborah up to make some opening comments, and then each panelist will take five minutes to share their thoughts on what an ambitious vision for public schooling might look like if it were to take their work and the work of our field seriously. And then uh, we will have a moderated discussion among the panelists for about 15 minutes, then we'll open the discussion up to you all. There are index cards on your chair, so you can, if, you, if a question occurs to you while the event is happening, feel free to jot it down, and the program staff will be circulating to pick those up. All right, with that, I welcome you again, and I'll turn it over to you, Deborah. Thank you, Naila. And good evening, everyone. It's great to see all of you here. 
Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to link this evening's program to the theme of the 2018 AERA annual meeting. As you know, the title of the theme, which you're seeing everywhere, is the dreams, possibilities, and necessity of public education. The theme asks us to recognize and mobilize our knowledge and expertise for the process of imagining a public education that we really don't yet have. In fact, uh, sort of secret about the theme is that I tried really hard to have the theme say something like the dreams impossibilities of public education, but I was vigorously talked out of that by lots of people because of course that's not really the point, except that to acknowledge the struggle that we've had to do something we call public education is important and honest to be doing in this work. Last night, if some of you were there to see the opening plenary panel, you probably witnessed a sparky and fiery discussion among the panelists at the opening event. And in that setting, Eve Tuck asked whether we can really imagine public education without an end to the nation state as we currently know it. And Prudence Carter talked about when, we speak, when you speak about undoing settler colonialism, it's undoing the very essence of the way things have always been done in this country. So it's fair to say that public education's possibilities have not been realized for many groups of people in our country. Achievement and opportunity gaps persist. Resources, including skillful teaching, are incredibly inequitably distributed among young people in our country. Alarming patterns of discipline break down along race, gender, and class lines. And all of these things have to do with the interpretive work that teachers and others do with young people inside of schools and outside of schools, as well as a much broader set of environments that influence the lives of both teachers and of students and all others involved with our youth. All of these things relate to the struggles of people over time that are historical. They relate to policy. There's so many intricate elements to understanding both why it is that we've struggled to create public education and what it might take to do that. As I'll talk about tomorrow night, the problems on one hand of constraints on schools and on teaching that reproduce racism and oppression on one hand, but on the other hand, the discretionary spaces of school that are also the source often of the reproduction of those very same forms of racism and oppression through the open spaces that teaching allows and that schools permit. These are issues that a very big and diverse we has to grapple with if we are in fact going to reimagine what public education could be. And here the notion of the we I borrowed from Bob Moses from last night, who recited once again the preamble to the Constitution and said, that we belongs to us, the us of current America, and we need to reclaim who the we is and what it means to embrace that and act with that. As Naila said, this is a meeting in which we're engaged with the contributions that research can make to that struggle. And here, we hope that we understand that it's important that we increasingly recognize a variety of voices, evidence, sources, and perspectives to inform our deliberations about public education. It's crucial that we recognize the perspectives and knowledge of historically marginalized peoples and learn from scholars who examine the histories of the struggles from diverse standpoints. It's crucial, as Spencer Foundation has always stood for, that we cultivate and support the development of new voices and perspectives through teaching and mentoring as well as through scholarship. And I applaud the Spencer Foundation for having such a history around trying to cultivate the next generations of scholars, activists, and leaders in our, in our field. We also must understand that in a period where truth is so easily replaced by falsehood that we must continue to stand up for evidence as we engage in debates about the possibilities of public education. And within our own community, to be honest, we must recognize the need to broaden what we attend to and what we value as evidence and whose voices and truths count in this deliberation. Finally, as the theme suggests around the point about dreams, this is going to take imagination as well as evidence and scholarship. In our quest for justice and equity in our education systems, we have to imagine a world that doesn't currently exist a world that honors the experiences, cultures, languages, and communities of a multitude of peoples. The imagination that's required for that kind of work entails humility, as well as being inspired by past efforts by many who have struggled and have in many ways succeeded in local cases to do things that are amazing. What we want is a world in which exceptions are not the rule, but these become normal. It requires of us something very challenging that we easily fall prey to, which is not to fall into the trap of confusing what has been or what is with what could be. That's the very essence of imagination. <laughs>
So tonight, I hope that as we listen to our panelists and hear them engage in the questions that they'll be talking about and we hear their discussion and you engage with them, that it will inspire us to use the meeting this year around our collective capacity to reimagine the possibilities of public education, learning about the struggles that have made it difficult, honestly confront those, and to move forward so that 10 years from now at the Spencer reception and the Spencer lecture, we're actually in a different place in our struggle and our understanding of what it might take to make public education more of a reality than it has been thus far. So with that, I think we'll be ready to turn to our panelists and let the show begin. Thank you, Naila and uh, Deborah, for this opportunity and the uh, Spencer um, audience tonight. Um, so I'm comfortable usually with uh, weaving in and out of the disciplines, and so you'll hear some of that inflected in some of my notes that I've written here, uh, particularly um, um, thoughts that we've seen come down from philosophy and sociology. So I'm thinking about the public, public education, the public intellectual uh, the public intellectual, for example, in the erosion of both the public and the intellectual uh, that we've seen. So discussions around public are really about space and how we exist in these spaces. And discussions and designs of space are themselves inherently uh, racial. They are about race. And one of the best examples we have is, is gentrification, for example, is how the space and race relationship um, is obvious. So uh, George Lipsitz once uh, wrote that this is about the racialization of space and the spatialization of race. And in particular, I'm influenced by um, three thinkers from philosophy and sociology, um, the first one being Du Bois and um, his um, phrase that we, uh, most of us know as double consciousness, which is the notion of being one body in two spaces. So to me, spaces are not just literal spaces, such as neighborhoods, but they're also existential spaces, right? So the, the notion of uh, black double consciousness is, is one warring body in two spaces. Um, I'm also influenced by Fanon and his notion of zones, right? And even in, in everyday language, we use zones all the time to demarc uh, demarcate space, so, such as even time zones, so we're in the East, Coast, I'm coming from the West Coast time zone. So that's not just about time, but space, no parking zones, hospital and school zones, military and no fly zones, redlining as housing zones, the zone of proximal development is the one we know. <laughs> in basketball, being in the zone, right? Meaning you're sort of in another place as you uh, make your shots. Um, if you're old enough, you remember the twilight zone. And zoning out, as some, you know, as we know, some 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 young people sometimes do when they're bored. And ultimately, what Fanon is talking about the zone of the human, the zones of being and non-being, as a demarcation both of space, such as uh, as we've seen in South Africa, the townships, that's a zone of non-being in some sense. But also, a zone of non-being is to, in a sense, in some sense, to have your humanity questioned. And the third one is Charles Mills, the philosopher of race. Uh, he um, actually is here at the Cooney Graduate Center. Uh, the racial contract is what he likes to talk about, and within that there are subcontracts. One of them is the spatial subcontract, which is the notion of how, through colonialism, uh, we, uh, we have the creation of little new Europes in the U.S., including where you, uh, where you are today, New York, while standing, as we've already, been, um, uh, we, we've already mentioned, on indigenous ground. So the public-private, to me, is a relation. Right? It is a relationship. Ultimately, this relationship is taught. Right? We teach it to children as early as when adults tell their toddler not to show their private in public. Not simply about public schooling, but really about education, public, private, or proprietary. What we're talking about is education as a public good. For example, Spencer as a private entity with a public agenda. So I would like to craft a critical analysis of the possibilities of the public and avoid its fetish, so that I'm happy here to be sitting you uh, here today to talk about this. So to me, the public and private are neither neatly separable, one here, the other there, nor fused indivisibly, as in pluribus unum, for example. One is infused with the other, 
and rather than synthesize them into a third possibility, like we've done with the local plus global, sometimes called glocal, perhaps we want to maintain the tension between the private and the public, which don't collapse into each other easily, but rub against each other like sides of two magnets with the same charge. So to me, private or privacy and public or publicity are shot through with one another, like secular and religious thinking, secular and religious policy, that as my late colleague Saba Mahmoud says, that what we do in one affects the other. So that changes in the public affect policies about the category of private, and policies about private affect how we behave in and create the public, including schools. So I'm trying to maintain the sense that the public and private is a relationship and that they're not neatly separable and that what we do in terms of policy, behavior, cultural understandings of one affects the other. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, I just want to recognize that we are on Lenape lands um, and again reiterate uh, what Naila said about that New York is home to the most indigenous peoples in the United States. Um, so I made a joke that I get to ride Zeus's wake right afterwards. I get to surf his wake after this. And I, um, you know, it's nice to kind of resonate with this. For me, um, one of the things that I think we need to think about is towards what ends. Um, the history of publics and public education, from my perspective as an indigenous person, um, has never been towards altruistic ends. It has always been towards indigenous erasure. Um, and part of what that has meant is thinking about particular forms of knowing and being as being um, legislated, um, as cultivated um, in our schools. Um, and so the possibilities of public education, to me, um, needs to ask a fundamental question. And that, for me, is about what is uh, just, sustainable, and culturally thriving futures, um, and for whom. Um, and so for me, when I think about these questions, I start to ask fundamental questions about how is it that we're conceptualizing learning. Um, and at the core, I was trained as a learning scientist um, in a really um, important time in learning sciences where the idea that learning was not always cultural, where that learning was not always about the constructions of identities and possible selves, um, or that learning was not always, that heterogeneity was not always fundamental to learning, wasn't imaginable anymore. And that the job was to create and reimagine learning environments where those things were given. Um, and then the work of thinking about creating education was no longer trying to imagine those things as not part of learning, not allowing for erasure or invisibility of any of those kinds of things. And so I'm gonna just talk a little bit about what I've been up to um, about understanding also how public education has become, um, at least from my experience and my perspective, a thing that only a few people get to decide. Um, and I've been after thinking about um, how public education has been part of the policy that took raising children out of indigenous communities for four or five generations. Um, that's taken us away from developing our own pedagogical expertise um, because our kids have been under the control of somebody else. Um, and so I think that one of the things when we think about public education is how is it that we are reimagining actually engagements and whether that's publics or privates, but what I'm really getting at is families and communities. Um, and I started out as a Head Start teacher um, and I uh, really thought a lot about how is it that what happens for young people when they come into these buildings called schools um, and do those schools know them, um, know their histories, um, know what their families or communities hope for their futures? Um, and mostly the answer has been no. Um, and so I, I think a lot about how we've turned to sort of thinking about what is consequential learning and I really appreciate um, whether consequential learning is towards markets or is it towards justice, sustainability, and, and cultural thriving, and a heterogeneity of that cultural thriving. Um, and so for me, when I um, think about learning, I think about the micro-interactional. Um, I think that I am really blessed to be able to learn from the thinkers, the critical thinkers who are really understanding kind of the long arcs of power, the long arcs of how injustice has worked and reproduced itself. Um, but from my perspective, I like to think about things at the micro-interactional level, in part because I think there is always a possibility to shift the micro-interactional if we can see it. 
So those reproductions happen um, in those micro-interactions between peoples um, who are always engaged in learning. And so for me, the, the question is, is that, um, if we keep talking about public schools or public education, and they're not synonymous in my mind, so I think a lot about how um, learning, learning is a human phenomena. We learn in all places. But there's been a way that the learning that is valued in particular places um, is legislated in particular ways towards particular ends. So for me, the thing that I think that we need to keep investing in is understanding how power, historicity, and whose futures are actually reinscribed in micro-interactional moments in our learning environments as places to reimagine. Um, what public education could be. So Megan made the shift towards learning, all made the shift to teaching. Um, because teachers, I believe, are fundamental both to the possibilities and impossibilities of public education. The question we were asked was to imagine what teacher education, teacher ed uh, development, and working conditions in schools might look like if we paid attention to the research. And I want to start by saying that the truth is, I can't answer that question because we don't have a robust enough body of evidence to really know what it is that provides for strong teacher education or professional development. Because as a field, we fail to invest in systematic research that would help us answer even fundamental questions about how teachers should be prepared, in what context, for what purposes, and for how long. So again, I want to call attention, uh, as a research community, this is something that, as a community, we're responsible for, and we have a lot of work to do in this area. So I'm building on still a partial research base to think about what we might think about. In 2005, AERA published um, the studying teacher education, what we know and what we don't know, 13 years later, there's an awful lot we still don't know. What we do know um, is that we need to think much more broadly about how we prepare teachers. So let me start with issues around selection. When we talk about teacher education, we often focus on issues of preparation. How do we prepare teachers? What are they prepared in? But teacher education starts with selection, and we should be paying much more attention to who's coming into teaching. One of the things that we know is that we should be recruiting many more teachers of color than we currently are. That to be able to have a teacher who looks like you, the research would tell us, is an important part of being able to learn, to engage in learning, and to see those possible selves and future possibilities. So we can learn from the research of people like Ed Brockenbrow, who's here in the front row, and Travis Bristol and others, about what it would mean to really recruit much more intentionally teachers of color into classrooms and then support them so they stay. We should also be thinking much more about how we prepare teachers um, and to think about uh, focusing on some of the foundational practices of teaching and learning. Megan has already identified one of those, which is how do you build strong, productive relationships, not only with children, but with their families? How do you deeply understand the experiences that students are bringing into your classroom and the myriad of experiences and it, that they've had in schools and what they're bringing to the project of learning? So how do we deeply prepare people for the very relational practice of teaching and understanding the communities in which students live. We also have to think much more deeply about preparing them to teach content, to really thinking about what it means to teach math or literacy and sending out novice teachers who are well equipped to teach, again, for ambitious instruction from the moment that they enter schools. Teaching is more complex than ever. And yet, we cram more and more into the teacher education curriculum um, as if that would solve the problem of helping people learn. Again, how do we think in some ways about focusing on preparing people well for some of those foundational practices so when they enter in, they're, they're equipped to enter schools and keep on learning. We also know 
from research again that we need to create much more collaborative workplaces, places that support teacher collaboration and inquiry so that teachers continue to learn from their students, from their families, from each other as they continue to develop their, uh, their craft. They need to have principals who support collaboration and know what that looks like and how they can do that. So um, again, Spencer is, I'll put in a plug for the Spencer Foundation website on teacher collaboration that they did with Public Agenda, but we know more than we act on in this area. So creating schools that really support that. So I wanna see a future in which teaching is seen as valued, complex, and professional work, where teachers leave pre-service teacher education well-prepared to support ambitious learning from all of their students and equipped with the skills and dispositions to keep on learning once they enter those classrooms. That when they enter schools, they have opportunities to collaborate with one another and continue to learn and that they stay long enough in the classroom to develop expertise. Good evening. Can you hear me well in the back? Okay. Um, so I want to offer an uh, optimistic comment about a pessimistic state of affairs. Uh, so with my doctoral colleague, now graduate, Sarah Fine, who's sitting in the fourth row, and you should hire uh, in the near future. Uh, I agree. We, uh, uh, we set out on a, a, a kind of odyssey-like study of American high schools about six or seven years ago. Uh, it was originally called Good Schools Beyond Test Scores, and if you had found us after year one, you would have found uh, two very depressed uh, researchers. We saw a lot of what has been documented in the literature, teaching as transmission, low cognitive tasks, disengaged students, um, lots of worksheets. Uh, and these were in schools which were recommended, which was sort of particularly disappointing to us. Um, and at that point, we had a choice. We could have written uh, an indictment of American schools, which would have gone, would have been in the tradition of writing that has gone back to at least the 60s, if not before, of people going into schools with high hopes and seeing um, uh, the stark realities. Um, but uh, instead, we decided to make a different choice and uh, find uh, the spaces, teachers, places, classes, pl programs uh, that were transcending this reality and to sort of see what we could learn from that. So from that, I just want to advance briefly three uh, propositions. Uh, one, uh, that the, uh, the periphery, music, art, out of school, extracurricular, clubs, electives, has a more promising grammar for learning, which is more aligned with much of what we know about learning than core disciplinary subjects. That's claim one. Uh, claim two, the best teachers we saw were trying to do a number of the same types of things. The elements we saw in these peripheral spaces, a uh, number of core teachers we saw were trying to create these same elements in their core classes, sometimes succeeding, but they were working against uh, core aspects of the system. They essentially needed to contravene or transcend the systems they were in to do that kind of work. That's the second claim. And then the third claim is, if we want a different kind of learning, we would need a different kind of system. Okay, so just uh, briefly on each of those points. I, I think your minds are probably already going in all sorts of directions through, so uh, I'll just elaborate very briefly. Um, so for the, um, for the periphery, we focused in on two examples, uh, theater in a uh, fairly affluent school and debate in a high poverty school. And we found that in both of these settings, they were characterized by uh, a clear purpose choice over uh, desire to be there, uh, a sense of community, interdependent roles where people felt dependent upon one another, uh, apprenticeship learning from older students and from faculty who had real experience in those domains, and what my colleague Dave Perkins calls playing the whole game at the junior level. Dave's idea is that you don't spend one year in Little League throwing and the next year catching and the year after that batting, and maybe when you get to graduate school you get to play baseball. You, you play baseball from the start as the way that six or seven year olds can play it. And so in these domains, people were trying to do those sorts of tasks at the level at which they could do them, but 
uh, the learning wasn't decontextualized. They had models for what they were trying to do, uh, and they were trying to, uh, to, to enact uh, those uh, models. If you look at the history of extracurriculars, and you look at the history of the sort of core grammar of schooling, the core grammar of schooling was set up to sort, batch process, racially subjugate. Uh, the uh, grammar of extracurriculars was set up to give students sort of miniature opportunities to enact the skills and capacities they would need in adult life. Um, which doesn't mean there aren't problems, there's not in inequality, stratification in those arenas as well, but uh, just a different grammar. The, uh, the best teachers we saw uh, were essentially trying to pull off those things within the constraints of uh, core disciplinary uh, classes. So they might give students, uh, for example, in a class where a teacher was trying to teach students how to write a scientific paper, students uh, got choice over what topic to work on, but the process of scaffolding of the paper was, uh, was similar. But, uh, and we've all seen good teachers, I think you could imagine what we would say there, but uh, they were in important ways working against the systems they were in, simplistic state tests, teacher evaluation systems, pacing guidelines, short blocks, high teacher loads. They were what my colleague Bob Keegan calls self-authoring. They were transcending the systems they were in. So what would a better system look like? Uh, it's easy to imagine what it would look like. Assessments that looked more like IB than AP, measuring whether students can produce products which demonstrate certain skills rather than simply covering content. Uh, vertically integrated uh, pathways to support teacher candidates, doing the kind of teacher prep that Pam is talking about. But the teachers we found, the really compelling teachers we found were 40 to 50 years old. Like, it takes time and germination, but we could make it less haphazard if we had systems that continued to build learning. Um, schools which build uh, learning communities, all the schools we studied had containers for PLCs, but what they did with them varied greatly, and it was what happened inside them uh, that really count. And then probably the biggest shift would be uh, for districts. Districts would need to change their orientation from seeing themselves as uh, compliance-seeking entities and become modern learning organizations that supported and networked uh, learning across, um, across their sites. Um, at time, I want to close with one quick final comment. When I gave a talk about this at Hopkins, David Steiner said, what you're really saying is, you've observed this really powerful mode of learning, and you're asking whether schools, as historically contingent institutions, can host that mode of learning. And I think our answer to that is maybe, sometimes. But if we want it to become more than the exception than the rule, we would need to change the systems that we were working in. Thanks. Good evening. That's a call and response. I call, good evening. <laughs> uh, I was asked to answer, and I apologize, I'm a little hoarse. I was asked to answer the question, what might schools and systems of schooling look like if we took seriously the role, needs, wants, and hopes of families and communities, and I decided to come here with a story. Around a month ago, the Chicago Board of Education, a body which is not elected but is unilaterally appointed by the mayor, voted to close four schools in the Inglewood community and consolidate them into one high school, and to close an elementary school nestled between the Bronzeville and South Loop communities and convert it into a high school. All of these schools primarily serve low-income black children, and in all cases, the stakeholders involved, teachers, students, parents, administrators, and community members, were vocal about their vehement opposition to this plan. At the time when the board was voting, Chicago Public School students from all over the city congregated in the downtown office. They were barred from entering the board chambers, so they gathered in the lobby and constructed a counter space. They sat in, they chanted, they dance battled, they footworked. They sought to remind the board who these schools really belong to and to challenge all of us to be in radical solidarity with them as they strive to put the public back in public schools. I'm going to rewind from that moment. One of the schools closing, National Teachers Academy, is near where I live, so I took a particular interest in them. And when I spoke to them, I was impressed that they had exhaustively tried to talk to someone, anyone, about how to keep their school open. They'd gone to every media outlet, every public official. They had data about how academically successful their school was. And they were stunned that it seemed like no one would listen. And then they told me about the emails. Yes, unlike in some other instances of contemporary American politics, there really were emails. And they really were indicting. 
Someone had obtained emails going back three years in which two prominent white residents of the community had been communicating with our local member of city council, as well as Barbara Bird Bennett, who was then head of Chicago Public Schools and is now in federal prison, after being indicted for taking bribes in, in exchange for district contracts. That's a different talk. And they were even in communication with the mayor. This handful of white residents expressed their desire to take over National Teachers Academy and turn it into a high school because the high school for which they were currently zoned was 18 blocks further south in the heart of the historic black community of Bronzeville, and it was unacceptable to them. National Teachers Academy was more proximal to a gentrifying part of the south side. It was a beautiful new building. And it was a building that was constructed at the site of the former Ickes Homes, a public housing project torn down by the city, with the promise that the children who once lived there would be allowed to attend a beautiful new school. And now wealthy white parents wanted that school, and they got what they wanted. I could talk about racial disparities, about con contested space, about gentrification, critical discourse analysis, about the city I call home, but I was only given five minutes, and my editor's in the front row, and I'm not above shameless self-promotion, so if you want to know about all those things, you can read my forthcoming book in more detail, coming October from University of Chicago Press. But in the time I have remaining, I want to remind us of Aaron Dotty Roy's important words, that there is no such thing as the voiceless, there are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. When you say that people in power ought to listen to the needs, wants, and hopes of families and communities, there are always ways to say no. The people are unruly. The people don't know what's best. The people don't understand. But as a person who spends a lot of time focused on the preferably unheard, I think it's important to pivot and take a look at those people whose voices seem to be heard loud and clear without a problem. There are people who make demands and see them met. And I have come to understand that the tactic of people in power is to stonewall opportunities for real discourse, such that the people without power turn to civil disobedience, then condemn and criticize those people as lawless rogues when they do things like hold sit-ins. Respectable people, they tell us, go to meetings. Respectable people submit proposals to those in power and wait to be heard. Well, the trouble is, it only seems to be the respectable people who get to shoot a city council member an email demand a school, and get it. Some people's needs, wants, and hopes are heard loud and clear. So as researchers, I think we have two jobs. One is to be pattern seekers. People at the forefront of battles for schools in their communities, those who are trying to enact the kinds of changes, radical transformative changes that are counter to the entire history of American public schooling that we've just heard about, those people are very tired. They're overwhelmed and they're engaged in a fight that is all consuming. They don't have time to bring up history or literature or data or to step back and always see the way that their fight fits into a broader struggle. So in my experience, they want to have those conversations and they want that context, but they may not always have the bandwidth to get it. That's our job, is to make those things present, available, and legible. And our second job is to be the change, to model in our own work the way we think policymakers and leaders should relate to the communities. That means that remembering that people are the experts on their own lives and treating them as such. It means not referring to people as subjects, not maintaining fleeting, transactional, exploitative relationships with them. It means listening. When we engage people in this way, it makes for better research, but more importantly, it makes for a better world. And sometimes that may mean challenging our relationship to institutions. It may put us at personal or professional risk. But sometimes you have to ask yourself who you'd rather hang with, the people in the boardroom, or the people having the dance battle in the lobby. Thank you. So this is an interesting task. So you've each uh, laid out some, some very particular perspectives on the question that Naila posed to you. And I think one interesting place to start with what, what Megan said, um, which is, um, let's see, I wrote it down. To what end, for whom? and then talked a great deal about learning. So I'm curious about how you heard one another about what might be implicit or explicit about what you're thinking when you think about a question about imagining something about public, private, teaching, systems, families, and Megan, back to you. Like, is there a conversation to be had across you about why are we having this conversation? Is there, not here, but in general, is there what, about public education? What is it that at this time in this nation or nation state or not, what is it we imagine ourselves to be having a conversation about and is that, is that a conversation we know how to have or want to have? 
I'm curious across what you've just said. You know, I, Go ahead, um, I, I am a person that says very frequently publicly that I don't believe in police and I don't believe in prisons. And that's a challenging statement for a number of reasons, but one of which is because it requires us to imagine something that has never, ever been. And I think the tension arising in all these comments is that we're trying to imagine something that has never been, something that perhaps we can't even call school. I think in that way, the project of thinking about uh, liberatory public schools is analogous to the project of thinking about a liberatory society in the sense that the United States was founded on chattel slavery and the genocide of indigenous peoples and the oppression and subjugation of those peoples, and yet we continue to believe in and strive for a democratic society that is capable of some just and good action. And I think the same thing is true. As Megan reminded us, public schools have existed solely and primarily to subjugate and control certain people in certain bodies. And so for us to imagine past that is something that is such a, a cognitive leap um, that I think we really have to be really courageous and audacious in order to do it. And it's not about tweaking, it's not about tinkering, it's about a fundamental reimagining of something that's never existed. Other people want to jump into this? Uh, so I'll say this really explicitly. I, I think we have to decide uh, if a settler colonial state is where we want to continue to be. Um, and, and I, you know, just riffing off of that, Eva, I, I think that. I, I also think that what that has meant at the um, learning level is largely we have chosen to narrate what disciplines mean based in a kind of epistemic supremacy, um, largely based in whiteness, right? We don't actually open up disciplines and the multiple ways that people have always made knowledge um, as the foundations for what a potential public education could be. And so in my work, I'm always trying to figure out, and I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be doing some of the disciplinary things that we do, but we structure power and knowledge in particular ways that have been aligned with the very foundings of this country over and over. And so for me, in my work, I'm always thinking about, I want indigenous children to understand Western science, but not at the expense of our own knowledge systems, right? And so part of what I'm always after is trying to reimagine learning where heterogeneity and kind of multiplicities of ways of knowing are, are just what is. By the way, other countries do that, right? It's kind of like the myth that it's hard to speak multiple languages. That's not hard for humans. It's social and political contexts that make that hard. So I think that we're having this discussion, um, and it's in conjunction with all a range of discussions about where this country is going. Um, and so the way I'm coming at it is I think it's a question of who has the rights to enjoy the full range of what it means to be human, right? And I think the terms public and private, and so I'm trying to be critical of, e of even those terms, right? Mm -hmm. I think those, those are terms that are sort of signaling for me another or more uh, grounding conversation about who gets to enjoy the spoils of being fully human. And I think that the discussion of the public, and it's not even just the case that the non-human or the subhuman is uh, relegated to the public, and the human is the private. I think it all depends how that gets deployed. So to the extent that in this, in one situation, um, marginalized people are considered, you know, part of the public, and in another instance, it gets taken back that, the, you know, they should keep their racial discussions private, and so it's private there. So I think that these are code terms, and I don't mean that in a sort of you know, espionage sense, but I think there are code terms that throw us into a deeper discussion about the purpose of school as it relates to our humanity and who has the, the full rights to enjoy that category. Jal or Pam, does that, how does that fit with the things that you're thinking about, the things that others have been saying? I, I think it, uh, when we think again about the histories of schooling and the histories of uh, teaching as well and who taught and for whom and in what communities, I think many of these issues of the purposes of education come into play. Um, I always uh, think about one of the jobs I was offered. So in San Francisco, I was offered the job of teaching English, history, math, science, health, and physical education, grades six through 12, 
in Buckland, Alaska. I had no business being recruited, it goes back to my point about selection, for that position. Um, and the fact that they would recruit somebody who had, at that point, never lived in Alaska, um, didn't know the communities, I think really raised questions about what are we thinking about this enterprise of teaching. Um, Judith Kleinfeld at the University of Alaska began a teacher ed program out of experiences of teachers. I had the wisdom at that point to turn down the job. Um, but those, they were hiring people uh, you know, from the lower 48 to go into communities and in they didn't know, they didn't know the children, they didn't know the communities. I had to really reinvent the whole process of teacher education. So Judith Kleinfeld's program in Teachers for Rural Alaska began a, a process of really starting from that question of who is the education for, who are the teachers for, how do they understand the communities in which they live. Um, Harry Walcott Watt wrote an essay, which I used to have my student teachers read, called The Teacher's Enemy. And that's profoundly alien to people who come into teaching because they want to do good. And yet, teachers have done a lot of harm. And how do we, again, make that visible and think about that in the process of preparing uh, teachers to be fully conscious of their role? From my perspective, it's a, it's a question about disruptive change. So. What Sarah and I observed in schools was um, a modern incarnation of sort of the apprenticeship of observation and Lordy's point of things continuing to sort of carry forward in the tracks that they have. And so the question, I feel like the question for us as folks who are both scholars and who have some obligation to the field is how to translate the discourse in academia, which is often several yards ahead of where the um, discourse is in the field. A woman called me, a reporter called me the other day and said, you know, I went to study, you know, how uh, schools were handling the issue of reconstruction in the age of Trump. And I was interested in like the ways in which it had shifted under Trump. And I found that like in, um, in higher poverty settings, which had more students of color, more teaching as transmission in upper tracks, more opportunities for kids to have critical thinking, and that those differences sort of swamped what I was looking for, which was the sort of changing political approaches. So at some level, I would, I would sort of encourage us to engage with the, the sort of core uh, shifts. Now on the hopeful front, um, we did see, you know, where teachers, when teachers are educated really matters. So schools are underprofessionalized, which is mostly bad from the perspective of us as researchers, but it's also good because it means that schools are sort of porous to uh, currents that happen in society. So if a generation of teachers learns some non-Western history, for example, they have inclinations of trying to bring some of that history into teaching with their, uh, with their students. Um, so I think the question is, could we build on what's happening at the teacher front and then we would really need to, to take it out of our circle and into a really big political struggle. So if you want to argue that um, you know, the way that history is told through US history textbooks reflects dominant settler culture, you would be accurate from my perspective of reading those textbooks. But it, that's a political argument that has to be won in school boards, districts, state legislatures, and it's possible. As to your point, you know, if you look at the sort of new standards in Ontario, the new standards in Finland, like there are places where the sort of the, the larger unit has decided, you know, we're going to embrace that. But that only happens if the politics uh, engages with those claims. So one thing that Eve said at the beginning about the cognitive leap, I think, of trying to imagine something that we haven't seen, and or if we've seen it, it's been in pockets, which means we haven't seen it, is a little bit why impossibility was on my mind at the beginning. And I'm interested because the panel, you're all people who think very critically and carefully about the particular thing you brought to this discussion. How you, in your own work, or how you would speak to the long assembled here about how one combines this consciousness and awareness of the things that several of you have said in different ways with what you what you do in the next what we're doing how do we combine the ability to see these problems and to confront the impossibility or to trouble these you know these divisions we make between words or the big question of who gets to decide how do we move forward because we're also a profession of of action or 
at least we aspire to be. So that doesn't have to be a common answer, but for the people listening to this, what's the next step as you would see it from the work you're doing? How does one take this and move forward to realize whatever the project is gonna be about education in the next even short interval, five years, 10 years? So I I like, I like the original title of Impossibility. I know, <laughs> you, you were going to let me do it too, right? <laughs> I like that. Um, I think that something is impossible doesn't suggest that it's impassable, right? The idea that something is impossible is the idea that we keep working for something that we will not inhabit, right? It is the idea that it regulates what we do now despite the fact that we can't re you know, realize it or even live it out. Um, that the problems that we have now are serious, they may seem impossible, but they're not impassable. Mm -hmm. Meaning that I think we have some good research that suggests that uh, you know, culturally re relevant learning is, 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 is something we can get behind. Critical thinking is something we, we have some tools at our disposal. Um, I think in the next you know, sort of midterm, the midterm picture I have is you know, how we can leverage um, the idea that we can look with different lenses at the very same thing called schooling, right? So I think that many people in the field have been working at introducing uh, new frameworks and perspectives so that we can you know, put them sort of side by side with the way and the traditions that we've had at our disposal. So and in that sense, um, to have uh, a different look at education you know, to, to put it simply from multiple perspectives, you know, and then to have them, as my um, favorite author, Saeed, might say, to, to look at them contrapuntally, to side by side, you know, and, and how they have to uh, then inflect each other. So. So, well, no, we don't have to, but it sounds, like stuff, it sounds like exactly what you have been writing about. So I wonder if you, if some of it relates to that, about the multiple epistemologies and what it might mean to embrace something that isn't the way we've thought about what students learn. Yeah, uh, so I was trying to think about like what's the right, I, I, I'm not sure what the right answer in this moment is to, the, to that question, but I'll tell you what I've been up to. Um, and for me, there's two ways. So I, I think that sometimes we think we need um, coherence in a way that traps our imaginations. Um, and I really like what you just said, and I think a lot about incommiserability. Um, and um, I often think that young people can manage multiple meanings. They don't have to all fit together nicely all the time. In fact, I would argue that humans do that across our days in all different kinds of ways. So, I mean, I think for me, what has been really powerful is to both design that with kids and families, um, and then with other adults that might choose to be the teachers in those contexts and try, um, and fail miserably sometimes, but also find profound moments where kids make sense of things in ways that frankly I hadn't imagined that they would. Um, I gave a talk earlier about a play that our kids performed last summer, um, nine, 10, and 11 year olds, who made sense of the news, made sense of the grand challenges that I think human communities are facing in the funniest satire I'd ever seen. And I thought to myself, good Lord, there's so much further than we are even pedagogically prepared to respond mm. to. Um, and part of what I think we did is get out of their way. Um, and so I, I feel like the challenge becomes for me is figuring out how, how is it that I don't actually get too far away from the thing that we're talking about. Um, and so for me, I spend every summer in the woods, on land, in the streets with children, mm -hmm. um, trying to help us learn how to do this together. We don't I have to go I down the line, it's I, I think about this every day, uh, both as a teacher, uh, teacher educator and a dean of a graduate school of education. And I uh, worry that uh, we're moving away from teacher education, we're moving away from investments in what I see as actually a critically important part of imagining the future. Um, if we can't imagine the teachers of the future, and teachers I see in many ways as the stewards of some of this work, uh, I think we're lost. And so I think the responsibility of schools of education to really invest in a f uh, rigorous a look at how we prepare teachers for this work, um, how we prepare them to be 
um, not only the creators of learning environments for kids, but for stewards of democracy, to help them understand what their role is and to really take that seriously. I think that um, is fundamental to our work. And I worry that we're seeding some of that work, that we're becoming multiple systems of teacher education. And in the context of public education, um, that seems to me to be a problem, where we have now specialized programs um, that are only for um, certain you know, charter schools or some that are for public schools, um, to really think hard about what it means to prepare teachers uh, for the future and how we can do a better job of that and not seed the responsibility. So I, I make two points. Uh, one is uh, something that I feel like is off-stated but not followed enough, which is working with rather than on the folks with whom we are uh, studying and uh, collaborating. Um, one of my, um, I'm doing a research project right now on Bill Penuel and his uh, DBIR team in Denver. And uh, that's a team that's working with Denver to um, develop next generation science standards constructivist bio biology education. And we were looking for and still are interested in sort of changes in practices. But what was really interesting in the interviews is the teachers said, I was really burned out, but it was really nice to work with some researchers and get some new ideas. The graduate students said, I was ready to quit because I felt my work was becoming less and less relevant. And now I'm actually working with some people and seeing some impact on what I'm doing. And so now I see a sort of path forward. And then the senior researcher said, I feel like I'm in a sort of really nice cycle of sort of trying to develop my best ideas collaboratively about what we could do, finding out where those ideas fall short, and then developing uh, new ideas. So that's kind of one. And then the second is that I just worry that we're kind of too specialized and not, um, we don't sort of put things together enough. So like, if you take the, the level of a classroom, you know, you could study whether a teacher asks good questions. But everybody knows that like whether a good classroom goes is dependent on the nature of the culture, the way that you build the chemistry, whether the questions relate to the task, whether the task is a good task, whether that task lands with those kids, et cetera, et cetera. So like teachers have to think holistically, as do school leaders, as do superintendents. And so while there should be sort of specialized research on dimensions of that, there also should be research that kind of knits those things together. Daniela is going to take over. I come. Um, is it on? I come bearing questions. Um, <laughs> so we have questions from the audience. I'll just kind of throw them out there. Whoever wants to respond can respond. Um, these two I'll ask together because they're kind of of a similar ilk. The first one is, what does public? Where does public higher education fit into this conversation? Does it also require reimagination? Is it part of the same conversation or something completely different? And, and a, a similar question at the other end of the spectrum, what about early childhood? Its potential role in addressing inequalities and its existent out, existence outside of public funding streams. Might early childhood education be the disruptive change that we need? So anyone wanting to take up either or both of those? Giles comment about not looking at this separately, we do need to be thinking about this as a whole system that really does start in early childhood. And the more that we can be learning about the ways, again, of working with families and communities to provide uh, rich experiences for children seems to me just critical. Um, and it's something that I think we have had, there are many, many people working in this field that we can learn from. Um, who are really beginning to set the frameworks for how we improve conditions for children and their families um, very early on that sets that stage um, for the rest of, the, of, of education. I, can I just add one more thing? And the teachers in early childhood are the most devalued teachers in the entire system. So again, if we really looked at what age matters most and where we would put our investment, we might put it in the teachers of early, chi of early uh, childhood. And yet again, that's not where we invest. That's not where we invest in their development. It's not where, really where, where we invest in a lot of research on their preparation. I mean, there are a lot of 
public higher education, but the sort of critical one in the current moment is, you know, a, a, a big part of the country and uh, many conservative state legislatures, uh, legislators are very skeptical of public higher education. Uh, Michael Young wrote this book in 1958 called The Rise of the Meritocracy, which argued that essentially like the Mandarin class would eventually get destroyed by the people who weren't the Mandarin class. There would be a sort of revolutionary overthrow and that book has really been uh, sticking with me for obvious reasons uh, over the past few years, not just in the United States, but uh, abroad. So uh, public higher education has faced huge financial cuts as I'm sure folks here have experienced over the last uh, really 25 years. Uh, and so some combination of public higher education making a stronger case for itself and the importance of its value and potentially changing and differentiating the things that public higher education does seems pretty critical. The only thing, the only thing I would add about the, um, about the early childhood context is uh, reflecting something that Jal said earlier about political struggle and our task as political framers. Part of the reason I, I write in public venues is because I see uh, one of my jobs as f using expertise to frame the way a public thinks about something. And so early childhood is critically important. It's an amazing place where we could do equity work. And it's also, as Pam said, a place where our educators are enormously undervalued, enormously underpaid, have no real monetary incentive to get the additional education that would make them better at their job because they won't get a raise if they do it, disproportionately women of color, um, disproportionately have very little labor protection, et cetera, et cetera. And that reflects uh, a societal problem, which is the way people think about early childhood education as a, as a devalued site. And that's a great example of a place where I think that as scholars, we could step in and reframe a conversation. Several years ago, there was a lot of public momentum about the idea of universal pre-K. Our job is to be the people who step in and say, not just universal pre-K, but it should look like this. It needs to work this way. This is the research on it. And to change public perception. And I know we can do that because when I tell people I study education, they tell me things like, what do you think about grit? You know, So I know that it's possible. <laughs> I know that it's possible for a, a public to take on, I, people ask me about the bell curve, right? I know that it's possible for a public to take on rhetoric framed by scholarship into their everyday understanding of the way policy needs to work. We just need to do a better job of stepping up and shaping those frames. Yeah. So that, that actually kind of... Can I uh, just add one yeah. thing? So, so um, I think early childhood is um, a really important time. Um, but, but I also think there's a really big question here about whether or not we think we're preparing kids in early childhood to be in K-12 systems as they are, mm -hmm. or, or if there's also something else. And part of what I'll say about this is, I loved being a Head Start teacher, but I hated sending my kids to preschool. And the reason that that was the case is because preschools have not taken seriously the way that cultural variation shows up already. Um, and so I worry a little bit that we haven't brought quite enough of a critical lens to what early childhood education could and should be, particularly if we're asking ourselves how to reimagine a K-12, a K to higher ed kind of uh, public education. Um, I don't think that there's enough reimagining that right now, too. Um, so this, this question actually speaks to this point about kind of <clears throat> the public view on research, and I'll, I'll read it, it's, it's phrased in an interesting way. If a Fox News reporter were here, how could this discussion change that reporter's perception of education research? Of education, of education, education research. research, yeah. <laughs> First of all, I think it's a good question. And I think it's a question we should be thinking about because communicating with the public means communicating with the whole public, the people who read the New York Times and the people who listen to Fox News. Um, so I think that question of how uh, educational research is portrayed, um, the result of educational research, I love, Eve, what you said about uh, the, our responsibility to frame some of this, right. um, but also to connect it to the evidence. And again, part of our role should be to provide the evidence for some of these recommendations and help frame a conversation about what it means to use evidence in, in making policy and pursuing possibility. 
I don't know what I would, we should say to the Fox uh, News reporter. Are you here? Did you ask the question? <laughs> but, but I think one of the complexities of this debate is that when we're talking to each other, our, we have a lot of doubts and reservations about evidence. The nature of the evidence, what supports what, what kind of conclusions can we draw, you know, how far can science get you in the really nitty gritty details of practice? Like among us, we have those discussions. But when we go out to the world, we're like, we're marching for science. So is that the right, you know, maybe that is the right stance. Like maybe we, in the public venue, we have no choice but just to sort of defend our core values and sort of have our internal discussions about the margins and sort of keep those internal. But I do think that there are some sort of core questions among us um, which have some sort of weird fractal resonance with the questions that people ask about us and we don't acknowledge them. When we go in public, we just say like, this is science, science shows X, you should believe us. And so uh, I just, I wonder about that. I don't have a good solution, but it's just worth thinking about. So I'll, I'll ask one more and then um, <coughs> I'll re release you all. Um, so Robert Putnam in his book, Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis, identifies major discrepancies in basic extracurricular opportunities along social class lines, such that the sheer availability of the many theater, art, music, sports programs, et cetera, that can make an educational, that can, that can make an educational impact shortchange children from poor families. How can we significantly reverse that problem? And, and maybe I would add, I, I feel like this theme of the in school and out of school, reimagining the possibilities of what school can be and, and finding the edge of that. Like what's the, what's the stuff we take from how schools run? What's the stuff we take from what's happening in out of school environments in this kind of project of reimagining? And how do we think even about that line between school and out of school? I think that's been the discussion all along is the difference between schooling and education. And schooling, I think we might agree, is a particular kind of institution, usually in a relationship with the state. Right? And I think that uh, after school programs bring up the question of the idea that education is broader than schooling as an institution. And it's already been said that learning takes place uh, in many spaces. And that after school is obviously the continuing of a, a student's education. And so I think that if we're going to talk about education of the whole child, right, and that that learning then includes not just after school, but what happens after school in communities, in families, is then included as a complete or more accurate and, and complete understanding of the whole child. So I think that. Um, it might be interesting to look at the in and after school curricular, extracurricular as sometimes um, a convenient way to understand and um, perhaps convenient for funding purposes, et cetera. But I think if we're talking about education, not as a slogan, but as Dewey once said, as a, as a way of life, then I think that th there is no real clear and neat demarcation between in and out of school other than, I think, um, ways that help us sort of manage our day, so to speak. So to zoom out slightly from the question, um, so in, in Putnam's work, there's a graph that he shows where he has these two trend lines of extra, this is the y-axis, of extracurricular activities over time and how many hours kids are spending in these. And it through, like my parents' generation, uh, they're roughly on the same, so such that middle class and affluent kids were doing the same things after school as poor kids, which was standing around outside doing whatever, right, with no adults. Um, and then at a certain time, it was decided that these extracurricular activities were going to uh, start accruing social value. And that's when the, the low-income extracurricular activities lie and stays the same, and the wealthy and affluent one starts climbing. So everybody started in the same place. And coupled with that is 
a society that starts assigning value to these things that you have to have money and time and a parent who can take off work and a flexible schedule, et cetera, et cetera, to access. And I think that uh, the reason I say I want to zoom out from that is I think there's a meta lesson there, which is in line with a lot of the other work that we're seeing, um, like John Diamond and Amanda Lewis's research. And Prudence Carter said earlier, you know, we should never think that diversity is integration. And we've spent a lot of time uh, looking at those who are, are harmed, who are on the bottom trend line. But I think we need to continue having a critical conversation about behaviors like opportunity hoarding and the many creative ways in which people in power will work really, really hard, no matter what changes we make, to figure out ways to accrue um, value and prestige to their own children. And there's a certain way in which every time we try to reinvent it, they're going to come up with something else until we address the deeper problem of how are we going to ensure that the kind of society we want is one in which uh, learning opportunities, whatever they may look like and wherever they may live, are offered equally to all children. Um, because as soon as we say, okay, well, now we're going to have free after school, you know, then it'll become before school and then it'll become during school. People who are invested in uh, retaining privilege will go through amazing backbends and creativity to do it. Um, and that's why we continue to have tracking and so on and so on. Can I build and respond Yes, please that? do. So yeah, I agree. It, 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 um, just like any other sort of form of credential, it can become part of a credential race to the degree that um, in some high-powered affluent schools in particular, people are trying to sort of accumulate college resumes by doing extracurriculars. They can suffer the same kind of like, is it on the test kind of function that you see in core classes in those same schools. So I, I fully acknowledge sort of those uh, limitations. At the same time, you know, at the school where we studied debate, that was like literally the only thing the kids could do other than sports. They had no electives. They had no other sort of semi-academic extracurriculars. Whereas at the school, there was theater. It was like one of like 200 things that the kids uh, could do. And I really think that that reflects um, priorities. It also reflects these spaces sort of assume different things about students. They see them as sort of capable producers. And so if we, if in our more affluent, whiter schools, we sort of see that as a wide, widely shared you know, practice, and in other schools we don't, I think that's a real problem. So I, I agree with you that in the long run, like, there will be sort of re-credentialing and opportunity hoarding. Like, that kind of inequality will, will come back. But I do think I've, we use some of that Putnam data, and I think we should be just as outraged in the gaps around not just extracurriculars, but clubs, specials, music, art, et cetera, as we are about gaps in core subjects. I, t I totally agree. I guess the only thing I want to say is we need to always pay attention to all the different places where we have to put out fires, but at some point we maybe want to like build a brick house, you know, and think about coming up with some structure that is not just um, because it will always reinstantiate itself somewhere else. Yeah. But it's it, it's I guess this conversation just makes me. Uh, want to emphasize the importance of paying attention to schools. Even as there are maybe more sites of possibility in out-of-school activities, school are where kids are. School is the place, the institution, that matters enormously. And it matters enormously, particularly for kids who don't have privilege. And so the challenge, as we started with, is how do we reimagine schools to be sites of possibility? How do we really rethink that? Can I, I just want to add that we've quickly recentered schools as the place of justice. Um, and we've also implicitly kind of assumed that intellectual work um, happens in schools and not across the day all the time, right? Like we're using language that says, here's extra, extracurricular kinds of things. And then that space becomes, without them, there aren't opportunities for learning. Um, and I guess what I just want to say is that I, I, I think we need to be really careful about how as we, I, I don't disagree with anything you've just said, but I, I worry that we reinscribe some of the sort of foundational kinds of things that I was talking about in terms of epistemic supremacy by the way that we're framing the conversation about out of school and in school. Um, I also think that we've, we've now alluded to it metaphorically that school is a material place. Um, and part of uh, what I sometimes think about is what if we stop thinking that school happened in buildings? 
like literally that, and the other thing I would say is kids are in school until we push them out, and they're in school because we have compulsory attendance laws that will punish teachers for not, send, or punish families for not sending them there. So while I totally agree, I also think that's the kind of historicity of holding on to, how is it that we've created the conditions under which school, kids are in schools, um, and why is it that when we get into adolescence and high school, there's lots of kids that choose to stop coming um, and how we choose to interpret their leaving um, is also really, really important about this. And I'm not actually suggesting we shouldn't keep worrying about this, but I, I'm just kind of questioning a little bit about like what assumptions are we playing forward as we kind of engage in reimagining things. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because <clears throat> it feels like a, part of what I'm hearing is there are different levels at which you could engage reimagining and how radical are we willing to go. And the second phrase that keeps turning over in my head because I'm pondering the fact that um, we, we pose these questions and, and, and most of you didn't actually answer them, which is totally fine. <laughs> but I'm, I'm wondering if there's, there are precursors to hope or precursors to imagining, which is to say we cannot imagine until we acknowledge all of the forces that are holding things in place because to do so is actually dangerous, right? To do so is actually to ignore forces that are then gonna come back and, and reproduce themselves. Anyway, lots of rich things to talk about as we move into the reception. Um, so I invite you in a moment to um, head next door and eat, drink, and be merry. But I also invite you first to join me in thanking our panel.